Now, I would be willing to say with confidence that no one has ever stood to preach 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16 without saying, this is a difficult text. So I just want to lend my voice to that and say, I'll ratchet it up. This is an extremely difficult text. It's difficult for a number of reasons, and it's difficult on a number of fronts. Just on the front of just understanding the text alone, it's difficult. Even reading the verses, you may have heard it read and thought to yourself, what's that mean? What's that mean? What does that mean? That's exactly what I was saying this week, too. Uh, I mean, just, just take verse 3, for example. Paul says, the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. So he's using a head there in a non-literal way, right? But then look at verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesied with his head covered dishonors his head. I think the first one's obviously literal, with his literal head uncovered, but is the second one literal? Is he dishonoring his own head or his head whom is Christ? Or take verse 10. In the first nine verses, Paul says nothing about angels. Verse 10, that's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Well, of course. Right? Um, it's difficult, right? Uh, it's also difficult just by way of application. <clears throat> Normally, you can read a text and the text says, don't steal. We translate that into our day, don't steal. What about a text like this? Uh, it's basically, you know, uh, have we been sending for a long time as a church? Do our Sunday evenings did look different? Mentally, if not Sunday mornings, maybe Sunday evenings, wives cover their heads. I mean, what's this look like? And then it's difficult, I think, just on the level of <clears throat> our own will, right? Our own heart. I mean, there's no doubt hesitation. I, I'm guessing on the part of, I, I think wives probably read this text and go, I hope, I hope he's not going to say we have to start wearing head coverings. Um... You know, maybe some of you thinking, I knew we were going to get weird as a church, you know? Um, and, and in me as a pastor, I, I, I want to be very slow ever to say, I know the text says this, but I think it's culturally bound, and so we don't want to apply. I mean, I just want to be very careful. So if my own heart, I've just questioned myself, God, whatever you want me to say, I'll say. If, if this text leads to this, you know, I'll have a gentle conversation with my wife, and we'll start wearing head covering. She will. I won't. Um, Praise the Lord for being a man. Um, and, and, and so, um, yeah, it's just, it's difficult on a number of texts, isn't it? So, so the way I want to approach the text, just in three parts, I just want to try to answer some questions, really. Um, first question I just want to ask is, what's Paul saying here? I, I'll try to answer that really briefly. The main section of the sermon, then, will be just answering a second question. Why is Paul saying what he's saying? Why, why does he want the Corinthians to do what he's commanding here? I'll, I'll answer that with three answers. Um, <clears throat> there could be more, and, and, and um, uh, they're almost all tied to what I think it would have said in culture, which is another reason this text is difficult to preach. Um, and then finally, I just want to just look at what's this mean for us then as a church? Cornerstone, what do we need to do? What do, our, what do we need to look like? So one, let's just ask and answer the first question. For my outline, I don't even provide you the answer, just the question I know, you know, what did Lee talk about today? His first point was, what is Paul saying? Um, nonetheless, there it is. What is Paul saying? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not even going to put the answer on there because I, I just want to say it briefly. Um, I think Paul's talking about uh, an actual garment, a covering you'd wave your head. Now, if you think to yourself, well, Lee, that's obvious. That's not even helpful to, to note that. There actually is debate on whether or not he's talking about an actual head covering that, that a, a woman would wear, a garment, uh, maybe you know, part of a tunic or something, or her hair. Is he talking about her hair? And, and the reason some suggest that he's talking about her hair is because look at verses uh, 14 and 15. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So if the woman's hair is a covering... Is this the idea? Is Paul saying you need a covering of hair, and preferably long hair? You know, that those who are most holy have really long hair? You know, women who are walking away from the Lord get shorter and shorter? You know, is this... No, no, I, I don't think he's talking about hair here. I think what he's doing is I think he's using hair as an illustration to say... And I think this is culturally bound. I'll explain this more in a second. But I think he's saying if in our culture... 
to look like a woman means to have long hair. Isn't that pointing you in the direction of, as, as the Lord's given you that natural head covering, isn't that pointing in the direction of needing a hair covering? So, so I think, again, just, just that one answer, I think Paul's talking about uh, a garment, some kind of something that a woman would actually put over her head and not her hair itself. Second, and I, I've already said this, but I think the reason this is a deal here that men ought not to cover their heads uh, and that women, uh, wives specifically, and I do think this is a reference to wives. You could look at it as uh, the, the word for man and the word for husband is just the same word in Greek. The word for wife and the word for woman is the same word. So he's saying man, woman, or is he saying husband, wife? And the ESV has translated it hit, um, in verse 3, the head of a wife is her husband. I think that's probably a right translation uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, really two easy ones. One of them is that the Bible doesn't teach that uh, the head, uh, that the man is just the head of every woman, but rather the husband's the head of his wife. So, you know, you're out at Kroger and, and, and you, you know, you're a lady and you see me and I say, I think you should get Heinz ketchup rather than this one. You don't have to say, well, he is, he's a man, he's my head. You know, I, no, I mean, um, a husband's head of his wife, not the man head of every woman. So I think these, we probably translate this right. And, and then it does say the head of every man is Christ. Every man has a head as Christ, uh, but the head of a wife, the, of a woman, is, is simply her husband. So I think that's, um, I think Paul's talking about uh, wives having their heads covered. And I think in their culture, for a wife to have her head uncovered would have suggested something bad. In fact, I'll go over some of these in a bit. But one of the things it could suggest even is that she was going by way of prostitution. So, so I do think these are culturally referenced. In other words, if you didn't know something about the culture, I think this text would be very hard to understand. And then finally, uh, Paul is limiting this to a uh, time in the service when they would pray or prophesy. Um, prophecy, I don't think, uh, some have thought historically prophecy is preaching. Uh, I don't think that's how the Bible uses the word prophecy. Uh, the Puritans sometimes would would, uh, you know, use the word that way, the art of prophesying, by which they would mean preaching, but that's not how prophecy is used in the Bible. I think prophecy is used especially in 1 Corinthians. Uh, when we get to chapter 14, we'll see that prophecy is just anything the Spirit might bring to mind that, that somebody would speak to encourage or build up or console. And so Paul doesn't hear picture men and women preaching, but men and women simply speaking things to encourage one another in the life of the church, to build up, to console, to comfort. Um, to encourage. And so Paul's not saying then at every point in the service the women would have their head covers, but I think he's saying, look, limit it to times when men or women would pray and men or women would prophesy, and when that's done, the men ought not to have their head covered, but the women should. So just simply put, I think that's what's going on. A literal garment a woman would wear over her head. The reason it's important is because of certain things it would say in their culture and it would apply in specific occasions where they would be prophesying or praying, probably because that would be a time where they would draw attention to themselves. And, um, and again, prophecy is simply a, a word the Spirit might bring to mind so that you can comfort, encourage, or console another. That's my answer to the first question. My answer to the first, second question will be a little longer. Um, why? Why is Paul saying this? Why does Paul want women to wear head coverings and men not to wear head coverings? I mean, let's just ask the question that... It doesn't seem very clear to us on its surface. But the reason I think uh, it is, as I've already said this, is because I think it would have suggested certain ideas in their culture. For men to wear a head covering would have suggested something Paul doesn't want suggested. For wives not to wear a head covering in those settings when attention is being drawn to them would have suggested something in their culture that Paul did not want suggested. Now, uh, <clears throat> the things then that Paul wants them to reflect... Uh, um, that, that, you know, one by one, if you just take them, the things that Paul wants them to reflect in their culture, I think are the same kinds of things we have pressing against us. So let me list just three things that I wanted Paul to, to reflect and the reason why this happened. One, Paul wanted them to reflect an understanding of authority, submission, and honor. In the first century Corinth, I'm convinced the culture was pushing back against the ideas of submission, authority, and honor. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, these are things in our own day that are being pushed against, especially men and women uh, in the church having um, certain roles or in the home, a man and his wife having certain roles, and one, 
walking in a place of authority and the one in a place of submission, these are things that are being pushed against. Well, I think they were in Paul's day as well. And so this is where Paul begins. In verse 2, he says, I commend you because you remember me and hold to the tradition. So it may be that Paul's saying, look, in, in a lot of areas, you're doing well. But now I want to mention an area where you haven't followed my teaching. Or it may be that he's saying, look, for most of the church, you guys are doing this well. But I know there's a certain group that is contentious about this. He, he mentions in verse 16, the last verse of our text, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice. That is, don't be contentious. So it may be that there is a small group in the church who was contentious about these things. Some wives who didn't want to wear head coverings. Maybe some men that did, although I don't think that was... Uh, probably the main thing, I think he's using the man as a, as a reference here, but, but maybe some, some wives who didn't want to wear head coverings. And so Paul says, uh, I commend you, but, 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 but here's an issue I want to take up. Verse 3, and here's where he starts. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. He starts with this note that everyone... Every person that exists, except God the Father, has a head. Right? Every man, you have a head, someone who's an authority over you, whom you submit to. Every man has an authority who is Christ. The Great Commission commands us that we must do everything that Christ has commanded us to do. In addition to that, this is now not saying women or wives don't have Christ's authority, but under that, women, wives also have another husband. The head of every wife is of a wife is her husband. So in the home, a woman who is married and becomes a wife to a man is both under the authority of Christ and she has another head, her husband. And then Paul says, and the head of Christ is God. I think reflecting here the idea that, I think the reason he saves this for last is because he's showing us that this isn't the fact that we carry authority and submission, the fact that we have different roles, doesn't mean we're not equal or someone is inferior, right? We continually see the Son submitting to the Father. Jesus says, uh, I only do what I uh, see the Father, uh, hear the Father say, right, or see the Father do. He, he submits to the will of the Father. It doesn't mean he's less than the Father. In fact, he is God, the Son. Paul says in Philippians 2, he did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, so I think the reason that Paul references here, he even Christ submits to the authority of the Father is to show, look, this is not a thing of value or equal, you know? But there are roles, and, and Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of his wife. Then verses 4 and 5, every man who prays or prophesied with his head covered dishonors his head. I think... That second reference to head, I think, is a reference to Christ. So a man who prays with his literal, his head uncovered, dishonors his head, who I just told you is Christ. Verse 5, but every wife who prays or prophesied with her literal head uncovered, dishonors her head, I think that's a reference then to her husband, since it is the same as if she were shaven. Now again, Paul uh, let me skip just for a second here that reference to if her head were shaven. We'll talk about that more in a second. And in verse 6, which it, it goes on that more. And note here why it is then that this would be dishonoring. Paul says in verse 7, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. Now that verse is confusing as well, isn't it? It might sound at first glance that Paul's saying here, look, men were made in the image of God, women aren't in the image of God. That's not what he's saying. We know from Genesis 1:26 and 27, both man and woman are both made in the image and glory of God. Uh, for God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, him. Male and female, he created them. So mankind, all of us, are created in the image of God, male and female. Well, then why does Paul say here, Man is in the image of glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. What he's saying when he adds that second part, but glory, woman is the glory of man, is not for him to say, see, I'm saying she's not in the image of God. He's rather saying not only is woman in the image and glory of God, but woman was also created to bring glory to man. Wives were created to bring glory to their husbands, to honor their 
husbands. So, and let me explain that here. One of the reasons then that we see right off the bat that Paul wants wives to cover their heads uh, when they are praying a prophesy and men to leave their heads uncovering is because he wants them to recognize headship. He wants them to recognize authority, submission, and honor. So I think in that culture, in that day, commentators argue this, and I think it's right. One of the ways that a wife would show that she is a wife to her husband walking in submission to him is to cover her head. One of the ways that a man would show he is a man leading his home and not somebody who wants to, uh, you know, act as a woman or abandon his role as a man would leave his head uncovered. So Paul's saying one of the things you need to do then in a public worship service is show that you understand and appreciate and, and, and obey the Lord's roles, the Lord's design of men leading their husband, of leading their wives uh, as husbands and wives submitting to their husbands as wives and honoring their authority. So think of it, for example, maybe a little bit of an illustration would be something like um, a wife refusing to wear her wedding ring in public when seen with her husband. Well, if we see that continually, that maybe, you know, she has it on here or there, but if there's going to be an occasion where she's going to see him, see him in public, a wife always takes her wedding ring off and leaves it at home. If we saw that, wouldn't we begin to think, you know what, that's suggesting something bad. Well, for a woman not to be willing to cover her head in this kind of setting in the first century would have suggested something bad. Um, one of the things it would have suggested is that she doesn't want to be recognized as this man's wife. Uh, it would show that she has an unwillingness to submit to her husband, a, a denial of the Lord's roles in her life. Um, if, if it was a man not wanting to cover his head, it would dishonor Christ. It would send a message, if nothing else, that he is unwilling to appear as a man. Now, I think there's also, it also seems, some commentators argue that there are, there are statues of, of elite in, individuals and maybe emperors in, in the culture who would cover their head in a worship service when they pray, and it's showing a status symbol. So maybe Paul's saying here, Look, men, if you, if you cover your head like that, trying to make yourself elite, then you're dishonoring the one who's your head. You've gathered honor Christ, not yourself. What he's saying to wives is, but you need to make sure you're honoring Christ, but you also need to make sure you're honoring your husband. So in this culture, if a wife left her head uncovered when attention is being drawn to her, she would not, she would not be honoring God, but nor would she be honoring her husband. She would be sending the message, I don't really wish I was with this man. Again, like a wife taking off her wedding ring. And so Paul says, look, a man and a woman are both made in the image and glory of God, but the woman also has the responsibility of honoring her husband. Well, how does he ground this in creation? Verses 8 and 9. For a man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. He goes back to Genesis 2. And he says, think about how the text worked. Adam was alone. Adam was created and he was there. And God made woman from man. He caused Adam to fall asleep, took his rib out, fashioned woman. Not only that, God made woman for man. Man needed a helper. God gave him woman. So he's saying, look, the design of marriage is so that the woman brings glory and honor to her husband. And so Paul's saying, look, I want you to reflect authority. I want you to reflect submission. I want you to reflect honor in this culture. Uh, it is important. And again, Paul's guarding at every point, it seems. I don't want you to think that there's inequality here as far as value. For just as he's saying in Genesis 2, woman is created from man and for man, he, he then argues very clearly also in verses 11 and 12, but I don't mean we don't need each other. We do need each other. Verse 11, nevertheless, in the Lord, man is not independent, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Paul's saying, listen, I'm not arguing this so that you'll think that one gender is superior to the other, that men are superior to women or women are superior to men. No, I'm not arguing that. He says, what I'm arguing is that I want you to recognize the Lord has given certain roles. Honor's important. Man, it's important that you honor the Lord. Don't honor yourself. Honor the Lord. Leave your head uncovered. To, to do otherwise would either be to cover your head and draw attention to yourself as a social symbol status, or to cover your head would send the message, you don't want to be a man. As God made you to be a man. Both of those would be dishonoring the Lord. Wives, to leave your head uncovered, would send the message that you, that you don't want to be recognized as married to this man. 
men uh, would, would sometimes walk around with women who were not their wives, being immoral with them. Those women would have their heads uncovered. He says, see the message you're sending? I, I don't want to be married to this man. I want to be identified like that. That's not dishonoring. That's not honoring to the Lord. It's not honoring to your husband. So, again, just to take for a second and think about this in our own day. As a church, we're much like, I think, the first century here in our culture when the culture is constantly pushing again the ideas, against the ideas of authority, submission, and honor. I mean, I think that the culture would think we should be embarrassed by the fact that we argue that husbands are the authority in their homes, that wives should submit to their husbands, that wives should seek to honor their husbands. That idea, maybe even me saying it right now, you start to feel a little uncomfortable. It's because the culture is just constantly pushing against that as if we should be embarrassed by that. I want to argue not only should we, should, should we not be embarrassed by that, but that's what it means to follow Christ. As a people, I never want us to try to be wiser than God. If God has said, here's how I've designed it, I don't want us to sit and think, well, I've come up with a better design. You can't improve upon God's design. So first, let, let our commitment be, God, we, we want to honor you. If you tell us that husbands are, are, are the head of their homes and that wives should submit to their husbands, then we want to do that. I also want to argue as well, we don't obey it for pragmatic reasons, but this is just good for happy marriages. If you want a good marriage, men, let me tell you what to do. Realize that your role in marriage is to reflect Jesus Christ. So here's what you need to do. Love your wife to the point that you would be willing to die for her if necessary. That's how much you need to love her. You need to love her as your own flesh, as your own body. If ever you make the decision to love yourself instead of loving your wife, that's sinning. To love your wife as your own flesh also means that you need to nourish her and cherish her. That's what you need to do. That's what it means to lead your home. To nourish, cherish, love her, lead her, wash her with a word. You should be continually showering grace on her. She should be someone who just is immersed in the gospel because that's who you are to her. Wives, how should you respond to that love from your husbands? You should see that and you should respect him. You should honor him and exalt him as your husbands. Don't put him down. Don't be embarrassed of him. Don't be ashamed of him in public or want to distance yourself from him in public. No, honor him as, as the church seeks to honor Christ and submit to him as the church submits to Christ. When a man and a woman live that way in marriage, it is good. It's good. Anytime a couple would come into my office with a struggle asking me to help them, my first question to the husband is, tell me what's wrong with your marriage without making any reference to your wife. Because I, what I want him to see first and foremost is, am I obeying Ephesians 5, 22 to 33? And then I'll ask the wife, tell me what's wrong with your marriage without making reference to your husband. Just because I want her first to see, am I seeking to obey Christ here and, and respect him and submit to him as the church submits to Christ. So again, in our culture, one of the things Paul wanted the Corinthians to show in their own day, and I think us to show in our day, is that as a church, as believers, we're not embarrassed by categories of authority and submission and honor. They don't mean inequality. In fact, they're the Lord's design and they are good. So that's the first thing, that the first reason why I, wanted, I think Paul wanted the women to wear uh, this covering and he wanted the men not to is because he wanted them to reflect an understanding of authority, submission, and honor in a culture that most definitely, like ours, didn't understand it. A second reason. Paul wanted them to reflect modesty and morality. Paul wanted them to reflect modesty and morality. Now let's deal with those verses about hair. At the end of verse 5, well, Paul says in verse 5, every wife who prays or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. 
Or again, verses 14 and 15. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair, um, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Well, what's this mean? Why would it be a disgrace for a man to wear long hair? Or for a woman to have short hair or shave her head off? Again, I think the reason is because of what it would have communicated in their day, in their culture. In their day, if a woman had short or shaven head, what it would communicate is that, again, I, I've made reference to this a little bit, but men in marriage typically had wives and additional sexual partners. In fact, you'll read some literature and it's just astounding to me. It would just be a regular teaching. Get married so that you can have a wife. She can, you know, do things like feed the family, raise the kids, but your main sexual activity will take place with women outside your home. Isn't that just horrendous? One of those ladies with a man that they knew was, that the culture knew was married, people would just assume that must be one of his ladies, one of his partners, uh, perhaps even a prostitute. So one of the reasons that Paul's saying to wives, cover your heads, is because you don't want to suggest that you're immoral like one of those ladies. You don't want to suggest that you're them. There was also a movement among some of the ladies in the culture to say, look, if men want to behave that way and men want their quote-unquote sexual freedom, then so do we. So we're not going to submit to any of these guidelines of covering your head. And so this was a, a feminist movement in the first century. Paul, I think, was suggesting to these ladies, you don't want to do that. You don't want to send the message that you're on board with that. You want to send the message that you're moral and that you're modest. Not only that, it was also known that if a lady was caught committing adultery, as punishment, sometimes she would have her head shaven. I think that's why Paul's saying, look, if you're not going to wear the head covering, you might as well go ahead and shave your head. If you're going to suggest you're an adulterer, you might as well really ratchet it up and look like one. Paul's saying, look, we don't need to suggest this. On some occasions as well, women who wanted to pursue a homosexual lifestyle might intentionally take this look, head uncovered, short hair, maybe even shaven. So in that culture, for a woman who's married to a man and yet unwilling to cover her head, look at all that she should suggest. She should suggest uh, immorality. She should suggest immorality of the, of, of the greatest kind. Men, likewise, to have long hair in that culture would suggest a homosexual lifestyle. Again, it was, again, you can just read the Greek literature of this day, but many, even pagans, will make reference to a man who has long hair and, and, and no doubt is pursuing homosexuality. So again, I think these things are tied to their culture. And Paul's saying, in either case, look, I don't want you to appear immodest, and I don't want you to appear immoral. I want you to reflect modesty. I want you to reflect morality. This is important. In fact, I think verse 10 helps us to see why Paul is so driven by this. In verse 10, Paul says, this is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Let's take the first part of that before making reference to because of the angels. Um, one, a symbol of authority on her head, I don't think is the best translation. I think it's better translated here. Uh, a woman should have authority over her head. And I think the idea here which is, I think, the way you would find this translated typically any place else. I don't know why they add the word symbol and, and, and on, but, but I, I think this is best translated as symbol, uh, or rather authority over her head. I think the idea is that she needs to have control of her head. In essence, think of it this way. Loose hair reflects loose morality in that culture. And Paul's saying you need to have control over your hair, cover it up to show that you also have control over your morality. Don't have loose hair and reflect that you have loose morality. Well, then what about this whole deal because of the angels? Well, there's a couple of ways we could take this. The word um, for angel can be translated angel or messenger, either one. Again, so you just don't know by looking at the word, oh, it's angelos. Well, I could messenger angel, we don't know. If it's angel, if that's the correct translation, 
then I think it should probably be the idea of something like this, that the angels uh, actually observe human worship of the Lord. And so for a woman to suggest immorality and immodesty while the angels look on to see the Lord glorified and worship, that would be dishonoring to angels. It could mean that. I lean, though, toward the translation messenger because of this. Um, in, in, in that day, in that culture, the Roman Empire was almost always paranoid, almost always paranoid about uh, different groups maybe rising up and trying to, to attack and overthrow Roman government. All kinds of conspiracy theaters, uh, theories, uh, leaders were often assassinated. So you can imagine then a movement in which a group is gathering at people's houses and spreading ideas. I mean, that just speaks of conspiracy, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes the believers met early in the morning because they were being persecuted, sometimes in different settings. And so Rome would oftentimes send individuals who would go in uh, as messengers, as those who would observe the Christian worship service and come back and report, if indeed it was possible. This may be what Paul will make reference to later when he says, if an unbeliever enters your worship service, you see why in the world would an unbeliever enter? I mean, this is just not common, but... And that day, perhaps one would come and make their way in, and they were supposed to spy and report. And so Paul's saying, look, even if one of them comes in, let them be, be overwhelmed by the gospel. But this messenger, Paul may be saying then, if they're going to come in and see the Christian worship service and go back and report, don't let them go back and report immorality and immodesty. Let them go back and report, listen, emperor, you may want to persecute these people, but let me tell you what they're doing. Husbands are loving their wives and leading their homes, and wives are happily submitting to their husbands and respecting them. They're loving each other, promoting good order and culture and society. They're modest people, and they're immoral people. Paul says, let them reflect that. Let, the, let them speak that. And as a church, again, these must be things we're communicating as well. Our culture is constantly pushing in the direction of immorality and immodesty. God forbid, God forbid that they come into our worship service and look at us and our attire and say, oh, they must be about the same things we are. The world needs to see an alternative among us. They must see that we reflect modesty and we reflect uh, morality in the way we dress and the way we clothe ourselves and the way we, uh, our behavior is in our church. Let us reflect morality. Let us reflect modesty. A third reason then. Why Paul wanted the wives to wear head coverings, the men not to, is because Paul wanted them to reflect gender distinctions. Paul wanted them to reflect gender distinctions. In verses 13 through 15, Paul makes an interesting argument. He says, judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovering? Okay, let's judge for ourselves, Paul says. Verse 14. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory, for her hair was given to her for a covering? Now that verse is confusing, isn't it? Or you just take it, does nature teach me that men should have short hair and women should have long hair? We might say, no, it doesn't seem at first. I mean, it doesn't seem like we naturally intuit it. In the early 80s, there was a trend of men, this was a bad day, but there was a trend of men growing their hair long and getting perms in the back of their hair. Like I said, that was, I, I can now never be convinced that culture is getting worse because I think we bottomed out right there. Um, but there was a trend of men growing long hair in the back and getting it all permed up, and man, I wanted that look. Um, so I asked my mom one day when I was, I don't know, eight, can I grow my hair long and get a perm? And my mom, in her great wisdom, said, no, I should be incredibly grateful until the Lord returns, that the Lord gave me a mom who forbade me from getting a perm um, in the back of my hair. <clears throat> but the mere fact that I was drawn to it, now what he taught me, it's bad or good just on its own, well, why didn't I just intuit it? A man, man growing long hair and having a perm. Nature teaches me I shouldn't want that. Or women, I mean, right? Does, does nature really teach you? I mean, and what's long hair, right? Does it need to be down halfway down your back or longer? I mean, there are a number of women in our congregation today that don't have 
hair really long? I mean, should you all be embarrassed, you know? I don't think so. In fact, you might argue nature itself teaches me I can't have long hair. Maybe you say the older I get, it's getting brittle, it's breaking, falling off. Nature teaches me I need to shorten it up a little bit if I want to have a decent hairstyle. Or is Paul saying here nature teaches us just by definition of men, generally, typically, it's common for a man maybe to lose his hair as he gets older. It's not as common for a woman. No, I, I don't think that's what Paul means. Again, because I just think it's hard to argue that. Nature doesn't seem to teach us those things. By nature, I think he means something like natural instinct. Isn't it our natural instinct? Okay, again then, why does our natural instinct for men have short hair and women have long is, is it or is it not? Here's what I think Paul's saying. Our natural instinct is for men to look like men and women to look like women. In the first century, to have long hair was to appear to be a woman. In fact, again, there are other Greek writings where they talk about men with their girly locks. These are men, probably pursuing homosexuality, who wanted to look like women. So if you saw a man with long hair in the first century, you were saying, I really want to be a woman. And if you saw a woman in the first century with short hair and shaved off, what she was saying is, I want to appear or live like a woman. I think what Paul's saying is this. Nature, instinctually, our drive is, if you're a man, not to look like a woman. This might communicate a little better in our day if I say this. Men, doesn't nature itself teach you not to wear a dress? Now, if you lived in a culture where all men wore dresses and none women did, then I would say, doesn't nature teach you to wear a dress? In our culture, though, to wear a dress is to look like a woman. Doesn't nature, men, teach you to look like men? And doesn't nature, women, teach you to look like women? Now, again, surprisingly, in the first century, maybe, that wasn't the only time in the world where gender distinctions, distinctions are being pressed against. We think this is a new reality. It's not new, but it is continuing. In our day, there's a continual push for us to almost be ashamed of gender distinctions for men to be men and women to be women. Let's, let's try to merge these together. It's okay for a, a woman to, to try to look like a man or a man to look like a woman. I think Paul would say if a man puts on a dress and puts on makeup and goes out, he should be ashamed of that. He should be embarrassed by that. God's made him to be a man. As a church, we need to be one place in our culture where there's a voice crying out, it's good and right for men to be men and women to be women. In fact, it should be shameful and embarrassing that a woman would try to be a man. A man would try to be a woman. Now, let me give a, just, just a couple of words here. Sometimes, and I think especially, maybe even over the last decade, I think the church has begun to get this, and, but I think we've run in a wrong direction with it sometimes. One of the things that's, that's happened is we said, that's right, men should be men, and then we describe manhood as a caricature of manhood. Right? Men should be men. We should be all riding Harleys and have a knife scar down our face. Right? Well, no. That's not manhood. That's a caricature of man. It doesn't mean if you have a knife scar down your face and you ride a Harley, all, all glory to you, brother. But that's not what it means to be a man. That's one appearance of what a man can be. To be a man doesn't mean you have to be huge. Praise the Lord. Um, right? If we, if we keep going that direction where we make manhood a caricature, you know what we're going to be saying to our sons who don't fit that caricature? You're not men. And they're going to start acting like they're not men. What we need to say to our boys is, you're a man because God made you a man. It doesn't matter if you're overly athletic. It doesn't matter if you're overly strong, you're overly fast, tall, short, whatever. God's made you to be a man, and you take your cues from the Bible about what it says to be a man. Right? Let's not, let's not go the caricature direction. Let me also just make a second note. This is, I think, really one of the ironies of ironies is the feminist movement, I think, has really degraded women in this way. What the feminist movement does is it says to women, you're only valuable if you're like a man. You're only valuable if you're like a man. You're only valuable if you do what a man does. Well, no. 
The Bible says to that, no, women are different from men and they are valuable as women. Women are valuable even if they're in different roles than men. Women give birth to children, men don't. That doesn't make women because she, you know, maybe that kind of suggests men aren't as valuable as parents, but they are, right? I mean, it just cuts both ways. Men are valuable as men and women are valuable as women, and let's not suggest otherwise. So, Though, though I, I do think this is all very culturally conditioned here with the head coverings and what it would suggest in their culture, I do think there are principles here that just we need to take up and make sure we apply. As a church, we need to make sure we're reflecting our understanding of authority and submission and honor. We live that out in the church and in our homes. We need to reflect uh, modesty and morality, reflect that in the church as we gather. And then we need to reflect our appreciation of gender distinctions. God made men and he made women, and we delight in men and women. We don't think everyone should try to be a man or everyone should try to be a woman, or if you're a man, it's okay to try to be a woman. If you're a woman, it's okay to try to be a man. No, God made you as a man, be a man. God made you a woman, be a woman, and delight in it. Okay, then let's ask then just a word of application as we close. What about Cornerstone? What do we do in light of this text? Well, one, let me start without answering the question of where their wives should wear head coverings or not. And first, just say this, because I think, I think this is an application for us. You have in this text a couple of things here that are, that are interesting and maybe difficult to think through. You have on the one hand, I think, this drive uh, to reflect male leadership in the home and in the church. Um, the head of every woman isn't man, but the head of a wife is her husband. And so uh, as a married couple, we want to make sure that, that, that the wives are reflecting that, that they honor and support the leadership of their husbands. And in the church, the Lord has seen fit to make it that men are pastors. Uh, men should be elders. He doesn't leave the qualification for a woman to be a pastor or elder. And in fact, he's going to say that a woman does not have uh, authority to, uh, to exercise authority and, and teach men. And so we want to appreciate those things. And at the same time, with that being said, we also have clearly this text. You have a gathering of the church together, a worship service where there's prayer and there's prophesying and both men and women are doing it, right? So how do we appreciate both of those things and reflect both of those. Well, I think, I don't know that this is the only way to do it, but I just want to give it as here's how we've tried to do it. I, maybe we'll change in the future. I don't know, but here's how we've reflected it. Our Sunday morning gathering, we gather in the morning, we're going to gather this evening as well. I'm, I, God is my witness. If you've heard me say this, you, you can testify to this, but I'm not now making up this whole paradigm just to answer this text, but I've said numerous times our Sunday morning and Sunday evening, don't think of those as two different things, but as one long worship service with a big intermission in the middle, right? So that Sunday night, tonight as we gather together in this room behind the sanctuary, this isn't some kind of unimportant thing or, or you, know, in, you know, something that's not very valuable. No, it's that we don't think we can get in everything that we want to do and need to do on a Sunday morning. And so we break and then gather on Sunday evening to do certain things. There's a lot of one another text that we don't think we do very well on Sunday mornings. So we set aside a Sunday evening service to do that. And uh, that's good. We could do it where we just make the service, you know, on Sunday morning from 10.15 to 1.30. But I think everybody likes our way we do it now. Um, and the way we thought of it is this way. Our Sunday morning service, one of the things we want to push is, is, is to represent that um, men should be leading their homes and, and men should be leaders in the church. And so we have very few, very, very few times on a Sunday morning where a man can represent leadership. Really, the way it works practically is if you ask for volunteers in the church, most of the time you get a bunch of women. I think it just speaks to men's laziness and that should be embarrassing to us, but nonetheless, it's what happens often. And so in our few roles of, of leadership on a Sunday morning, I like the preaching, of course, that's commanded in the Bible, but even just the, the one time where we have the scripture read by a member of the congregation and prayed or, or, or somebody from stage will pray. One of the things we've said is let's let those opportunities be opportunities for men to, to lead and to show their willingness to step up and lead. Let us represent that reality that I think Paul wants to be represented in this text. Let's represent it in our service in that way. 
And then on Sunday evenings, when we gather for prayer tonight, I think the prayer service, what we're doing on Sunday night, you could say is an entire service dedicated to prayer and prophecy. Because uh, we share prayer requests, we pray, and if the Spirit moves us, we, we, we speak to one another. Just words of encouragement, words of building up, words of consolation. I think that's what the Bible calls prophecy. And when we do that on Sunday nights, you know what? That's open up to everybody. We want men and women to be involved in that. So that's how we've thought of it. Let's let that aspect of the service, we want to reflect that here. We want to reflect our leadership there. We've just tried to do both. Again, I don't know if it's the best way. I know it's not the only way, but it's the way we've tried it to reflect both of these realities in our worship service. So then you could say, okay, well, then because we've done it that way and, and women aren't going to be, you know, coming up and praying or prophesying, then at least they don't have to wear head coverings on Sunday mornings but probably they should on Sunday nights. And my answer is, and I, I, I just, I don't say this flippantly. I, I almost thought at one point about making a joke about, did everybody bring their head covering today? And uh, I just don't want to do it because I don't want to suggest that we're flippant in any way. God is my witness. I pray that my heart would be such that if I thought this text wanted every wife to wear a head covering, I would stand up here and say, wives, wear your head coverings. I know we might be weird as a church if we did it. We might be like that church, you know, but that's okay. So I, I don't say this flippantly, and I don't say it quickly. I don't think that the Bible demands of wives that you have to wear head coverings, even when you're in a service with us and you're praying and prophesying. I think that head coverings or what Paul brings up here, because it was bound to what it reflected in their culture. Let me give you an example of this. Several years back, we had a lady um, in our church who would consistently wear head coverings, and that's fine. If as an individual, you say, Lee, I've come to a different conclusion than you, and I'm going to wear a head covering on Sunday mornings, that's fine, whatever. Uh, Sunday evenings, that's fine. Um, but we had one lady doing it, and I had a visitor come to me one day, and she said to me after the service, she pointed to that lady wearing a head covering, and she said, um, why does that lady want to draw attention to herself? And I explained to the visitor, I said, that's not at all what she wants to do. She's just trying to obey this text, and she and her husband, they think this is the way they need to honor it by her wearing that head covering. I said, in fact, she wants to communicate something the opposite of what you think. She wants to communicate submission and a willingness to walk after her husband. But it was interesting to me that in our culture, in our day, to that woman, her first impression was she must want to draw attention to herself. I think Paul would say, if that's what wearing a head covering does, then in our culture, don't wear it. Don't draw attention to yourself. So I think rather than saying, let's take up the specific application, wives must wear head coverings, in our day, I don't know that that would reflect submission and modesty and morality. I don't think it would reflect, I'm happy to be a woman. But there are a number of other things we can do to apply that timeless principle. And that's what I want to say. This text does give us timeless principles. We should appreciate authority and submission and honor. We should appreciate modesty and morality. We should appreciate the fact that we're made a man or a woman and reflect that. And so, although I'm telling you, I don't think you have to wear head coverings, wives, when we gather tonight, I am saying to you, but make sure you appear modest. Make sure you send a message that you're chasing after morality, that you're willing to honor your husband and submit to him. That, that you're happy to be a woman. Uh, delighting the fact that God has made you such. So although the specific application I don't think has to carry over, and I think we are free from wearing head coverings, I do think we're bound to honor the principles of this text. And as culture changes, we need to can always make sure that in whatever culture we're in or wherever we go, that we're communicating that. If you go to a culture that in order to communicate modesty, you have to be covered from head to toe, then I would encourage you to cover yourself from head to toe to reflect modesty. Why put before the unbeliever an obstacle to stumble over on his way to the gospel? Don't do it, right? This goes back to what Paul said before. In fact, I think that's the reason why Paul goes from 11.1 to this text. He ends, uh, or rather, 10.31, uh, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Now, when it comes to public worship, do it to the glory of God, right? Now, if your answer right now is to say, okay, I get it. I just feel like I failed in this, though. Maybe we've not reflected these things in our lives. We've not reflected authority, honor, and submission. We've not reflected modesty and morality. Maybe we have. Maybe some of you have been uh, struggling and chasing after homosexuality. Well, then what do you do when you read a text like this? The answer is you repent. 
It's an opportunity for us to repent. And, and, and the great message of the Bible is that is if you repent of your sin, if you turn from your sin, there's hope. Because God could have condemned us all, but instead he sent a son who took on flesh, who lived a perfect life of obedience, who died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin of anyone who would believe in him, and then raised him from the dead on the third day. So if this morning you recognize that you've been walking in sin, repent of it, turn, place your faith in Christ, and be forgiven by him. If you're a believer and you've been walking in sin, repent and look to the cross in faith. If you're, if you're an unbeliever this morning and you've been walking in sin, repent and become a believer. And, and if you become a believer, then, then show that to, to the world. Make this public testimony by being baptized, by being uh, immersed in the water and brought back up, showing that you're identifying yourself with the one who lived, who died, and was buried, and who was raised from the dead on the third day. If you've made a profession of faith or baptism, you're a believer in good standing with an evangelical church, and we're going to come to the table now to... to publicly proclaim our faith is in the one who gave his body and shed his blood for us. And as we say every Sunday as well, let this be a proclamation on our part. Lord, we've heard your word and we received it. Lord, following you, if it means living a life of submission and modesty and morality, then our answer is yes and amen. So let's take a moment of silence now as we prepare to come to the table this morning.